It's a pleasure to talk to you today. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, run the BD2K Center for Genomics. Uh, I got into this uh, with the first race to sequence the human genome. It was uh, a very exciting time in 2000 uh, when the final steps were being taken towards the first human genome sequence. Yeah, your genome is essentially a blueprint for taking you from a single fertilized egg all the way into a human being. It's very complex. Three billion bases of A's, C's, T's, and G's. So at the time when we were racing to sequence the first draft of the human genome, there were many that thought it wouldn't be possible. One company, Solera, actually had a great idea for doing it faster than the public project, and that's what sped things up. The public project was actually planning to finish in about 2005, but under pressure from the private company Solera, the 20 senders of the public project got together and started cranking out pieces of DNA as fast as they possibly could. The original plan was to finish the genome in 2005 by very carefully stitching each piece together. But since the public project was accelerated so dramatically at that point, what we actually had in early 2000 was a giant pile of short DNA pieces. These pieces created a, at least 600,000 piece jigsaw puzzle for the public. At this point, there was really no program available to assemble these pieces, and none of the other researchers in the public project were succeeding in bringing one forth. And so the exciting story is that a graduate student named Jim Kent from UCSC actually stepped up and in the last four weeks wrote tens of thousands of lines of C code that actually took 13 different types of input on the order and orientation of these pieces and in a greedy method, assembled the first human genome. That uh, assembly was actually the one that was the basis for the announcement on June 26th. And then on July 7th, 2000, we did something that Solera wouldn't have done. We posted that genome unrestricted on the internet. At that point, humanity's recipe became open source. And it has been ever since. That moment when we posted the genome, I remember thinking, here we are now copying the genome in a way that nature never intended. At light speed, copies of the first human genome were broadcast to every corner of the planet. In a way, we stepped through a portal at that time. We became the first species to read our own recipe. That was really just the beginning of an effort that led to an international quest to now understand this recipe that we had sequenced. And we played a role in that as well by creating the UCSC Genome Browser. The UCSC Genome Browser organizes the information about the reference human genome in such a way that we can compare all the different data sets to each other. Researchers from all over the world have actually contributed thousands of tracks of information to this resource, which is now an essential research for biomedicine. We get 1.3 million hits a day to this. It's been cited 20,000 times in the scientific literature. It really is a fundamental tool at this point. But since this time, we've gone from large data to truly big data. And the reason is that now it's not about a single reference genome and all that we know about it, but it's about sequencing everybody's genome. That first genome cost $300 million to sequence. Now a genome costs about $1,000 to sequence. I heard that 
You and Ashley spoke yesterday, and I don't know whether he gave this anecdote, but his favorite anecdote is that if the automobile industry had improved at the same rate, a Ferrari would cost 40 cents today. DNA sequencing might well be the most disruptive technology ever invented. The problem that we face today is that although it's now becoming routine to sequence DNA to some degree in all of the major research hospitals around the world, we haven't reached the point where we can actually use that for precision medicine. What we've got emerging is a series of essentially genome silos that are forming. And the reason for this is that if you ask a medical research facility to share their DNA with you, they immediately say, well, our policy is that to protect patients' confidentiality and privacy, we keep the DNA information in our institute and never let it leave. That is creating an enormous problem. We will never learn how to treat rare diseases unless we can compare DNA and phenotype from multiple different samples from all over the world. And believe me, every disease at the molecular level is a rare disease. I want to talk today about the main mission of the BD2K, which is to get the world to share this information. What we would like to do is build, essentially, the internet highway of information for DNA sequence coupled to phenotypic information such as clinical outcomes so that the world can share the DNA sequence as we approach the anticipated era of millions of genomes being sequenced. This information is absolutely vital to patients in the long run. And I'll tell an anecdote here we have a center of exchange for information about childhood cancer. We got into this because we created the largest cancer database in the world, the Cancer Genome Hub for the National Cancer Institute, and it contains over 10,000 cancer genomes for adult cancers, and NCI also has a project for child cancer, so we put in the thousands now of childhood cancers, pediatric cancer cases. And in doing that, we wanted to share that data and have that used by the largest number of pediatric oncologists we could find. We formed a network of 21 different centers around the world. And from those centers, we have agreements now that they will use our network to share information about pediatric cancer cases. For example, we have a case now of a young boy, let's call him Brian, and his cancer recurred after two years of apparent clearing. At this point, since he'd already had radiation and chemo, it wasn't clear that there were any real options left. It was a very rare form of cancer that formed from the lining of the brain. But because he was part of the center, and because his physician was anxious to do everything he could, he sequenced the genome, and with our network was able to compare it to all of the other genomes that were available. And in that comparison, some aspects of the tumor came out. In particular, it had some molecular aspects that made it look more like a tumor that's common in the spine, in the nerves of the spine. And through that, it suggested a new treatment, and Brian is now on that treatment, and we're hoping for the best. We don't know. This is a story without end, as are every new case that come up uh, in, the as in the last few months. But the important point of this is that everyone who shared their genomes helped Brian. The point is that if we can share this information, 
It gives new hope. You can help others by sharing your genome. That's the main message, and the point of the BD2K is to make this sharing possible. We want to create a worldwide network of sharing that allows the responsible use of genomic information, not only for basic discoveries, but ultimately for routine clinical use. One of the things we learned from this is that Brian's case is not unusual at all. In fact, in work that my colleagues, Josh Stewart and others of the International Consortium for Cancer Genome Sequence are doing right now, we are seeing that at least one in five tumors looks more like a different class of tumor at the molecular level than would be suggested by its tissue of origin. For example, a lung cancer at the molecular level may look more like a bladder cancer, suggesting alternate treatments. A prostate cancer may look more like a lung cancer. So until we unravel the molecular basis for cancer, we really won't know the exact disease that we're dealing with. We won't be able to achieve the precision medicine that we've been looking for. And it's a matter of sharing data that will get us to that ultimate precision medicine. Now, it's not simple. It's not as easy as, oh, everybody just get your genome and put it in Dropbox. Obviously, there are heavy social issues here, serious issues about privacy, security. There's also a tendency at different medical institutes to not want to share to preserve some competitive advantage. We have to overcome all of these social issues, and our BD2K is working with the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which I co-founded. It is an international organization that's devoted to overcoming not only the social barriers, but the technical barriers to sharing DNA at the large scale we need to share it. I hope you will work with me on this. I would encourage you to think about your interactions with your medical institution. Try to encourage them to consider sharing your medical information and especially your DNA information with other centers. And this applies not just to cancer, but to all diseases. Think about asthma, Alzheimer's, every disease from A to Z potentially has a genetic component that could be addressed on a broader global scale if we can share our genomes. We can do this. I think if we work hard together, we will overcome these barriers and create a world like the world we had when we first did the human genome, and we were all working together in a, as much an open source manner as possible. We can reach that. Thank you.